Welcome to the castles, a massive stone enclosure the size of a football pitch. And for once on Time Team, there's plenty of archaeology on the surface. So what's the big mystery? With 5,000 tonnes of stone right in front of us, this should be easy. Well, in fact, for hundreds of years, this site's baffled everyone who's seen it. It's been called everything from an Iron Age homestead to a Roman prison to a Dark Age stronghold. So what was it really? When was it built? And who was the king of the castles? We've only got three days. Is that enough time to find out? The remains of the castles lie near Hamsterley, 20 miles southwest of Durham in the Weir Valley. Sitting on the side of a hill in a sheep farm, the site's a huge dry stone enclosure measuring approximately 70 by 90 metres. Now overgrown with trees, its crumbling walls still form a monumental structure. But even so, no one knows what it is or when it was built. Do we know anything about this site? Well, the first mention of the site is the 1760 estate map, where it's called the Castles. It's kept that name since that time. Uh, about 100 years ago, a local antiquarian excavated the site, and I did a survey a few years back. And neither the antiquarian excavations nor my own survey were able to, to provide a good date for the site, so it's something of a bit of a mystery. But this is a sheep farm. Why couldn't it just be a sheep pen? It's a bit elaborate for a sheep pen. <laughs> a massive structure to hold a few sheep in. So what do we do, Phil? Well, I mean, basically, we've got to try and find out what the function is yeah. and what the date is. And there's three actual places that we can attack. Firstly, there's a ditch that runs all the way round. Now, that ditch might have environmental evidence that will give us some idea. Secondly, we want to target the wall itself and, if possible, the old ground surface that's sealed underneath the wall. Thirdly, we've got the interior, if geophysics can give us any targets. So the team stormed the castles, with our environmental archaeologist Emma beginning to core the enclosure ditch. This is the best place to find organic remains, which might give us crucial dating evidence. While Emma gets her first taste of the site, Stuart's scouring the perimeter of the enclosure to see how the stones stack up in the landscape. And Henry and Phil begin to survey the wall to find a location for a trench, because if we dig down to the foundations and uncover the ground it was built on, we might reveal some finds to give us a date. I'm just waiting for the satellites for a bit and then I'll get it set out for you, Phil. It's a bit tricky with the trees. So you're holding me up? I'm sorry, I'm holding everybody up. So you might as well get out of the way then. <laughs> I'll get a tape, tape measure. <laughs> Although this massive site has always attracted speculation, bizarrely, it's only really been investigated once, in the 1920s, by a local antiquarian called Hodgkin. But is his work a help or a hindrance? Do we know much about this antiquarian? His name was Hodgkin, he lived locally. In fact, he lived just over the hill over there. Now, when he was on site, he put a few trenches in. He was looking for internal structures, but right. he didn't find any, unfortunately. What about finds? No, there was no finds either. Uh, but there is a list of local reports of things found in the area. Things like the arm bones of a youngish woman, or fossilised tusks, or a few flints. <laughs> what about the outside walls? Did he do any work there? Uh, yeah, as you can see, he cleared away a lot of the rubble to expose the facing. Uh, and he also exposed this great, fantastic gate here. It's really well preserved. That's, That's great, isn't it? But presumably, we don't know what part of the structure is original and what mm. part he just put back. But more importantly, around the back of that wall, he discovered the most amazing guardhouse. Nice. Let's have a look. Oh, Mick, have you seen this? Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? Is it really a guardhouse? It's guard very house? difficult to believe that this is all original, though, isn't yeah. it? Well, we have his photos. Right. And the photos do show these openings into this guard chamber. So it looks if like it is original. Yeah, I think it's got to be, but I think the only way we're going to prove it for sure would actually to be dig a hole on the other side, because when you get one guard chamber, you get a matching one on the other side. That's what I want to do next. What, me. where this uh, gorse bush is? Yeah, well, I think we've got to base it on this bit of wall here. Yeah. And just go back there. Tell you what, we can tell people where to put the trenches in. There's going to be a heck of a lot of stone shifting, there isn't is. there? We'll just mark it up and slope off. I'm mad, <laughs> So we're putting in a trench on the eastern side by the entrance to the enclosure to see if there is another guardhouse. 
If we find one, it'll tell us if the existing chamber's original and give us an architectural clue to the castle's date and function. Now we're moving. Laying siege to the entrance, the archaeologists flex their muscles, beginning to shift the mountains of tumbled stone. Do you know what? They'd have had to have done this in reverse when they were building it. We're also putting in another trench across the north wall, hoping to learn more about its construction and locate the early ground surface and datable artefacts. By digging on this side, we've got less stone to shift, since the wall's least built up here. Surrounded by trees and gorse, Geofiz is stuck between a rock and a hard place. So John's hooked up with Frank the farmer to tap into his local knowledge and see if he can narrow down a target. But there's evidence of ridge and furrow ploughing from the past in here. Well, I would say the ridge and furrow would be done in the 1800s. They've left this area in the middle. I would say the reason they have left it was because they've obviously hit a, an obstruction. In Hodgkin's report, um, he claimed that uh, they, they dumped stones in the central area here when, when they'd cleared it because it was so wet. But yeah. if you're clearing land, you, you wouldn't put your stones right in the middle. You'd go to the side. You, you'd go to the periphery, especially when you've got all this area to, to dump your stones on. So this could be a good target for us to look at in the first instance? I would say it definitely does need looking at, yes. John begins to geophys the interior to find evidence of internal structures. Since working out of date's one thing, but understanding its function is even more of a challenge. In the entrance, we're trying to discover if there's a second guard chamber. But since the castle's is basically a massive dry stone wall, it's hard to tell fallen rubble from standing remains. Does it have had any, any kind of bonding material at all? Well, sometimes with these dry stone structures, they used to put clay bonding, almost like a putty, in between right. the stones, but it washes out with the rain. I think you're still in rubble there, actually, Matt. The longer we're here, the more of a mystery this place seems to be. It's one of County Durham's least understood sites. What are the stories about it? In the first century, this area was occupied by the tribe of the Brigantes, and their relations with the Romans were quite turbulent at times, and the theory goes that the castles could have been a refuge when they were defeated in a major battle near their main base near Stanwyck. What else? Um, another one is it was a Roman penal colony uh, where slaves working in neighbouring lead mines uh, were kept. Now, both of these suggestions are theoretically possible. We're not that far from Stanwyck, and there are lead deposits in the area but there's no real evidence for either. So it's one of those things where people tell a story about a place and after a while everyone just believes it? Yes, it's sort of fiction becoming fact or speculation becoming fact. The castles is steeped in legend, but this just increases our challenge to separate the fiction from the facts. So what about the idea it's Roman then? I actually don't think I buy it because Although we've got a very good Roman military context, 30 miles south of, Hadrian, of Hadrian's Wall, just off uh, the main Roman penetration route, Deer Street, the fact is it's off the road system. What about something later than Roman? Then? We know that sites such as Bird Oswald and Binchester carried on being occupied as fortified places in the sub-Roman period, but of course, excavation in this part of the world has tended to fo focus on Roman fort, so that's where we found it. <laughs> so if there were sub-Roman sites that weren't Roman military to start with, and ours was one of them. We wouldn't really know about those. We wouldn't have excavated them, no. What about the earlier period, then? One thing is quite clear, that you do get prehistoric sites which are rectangular in shape, with a ditch and bank around them, with a single entrance, just like you've got here at the castles. There is no reason at all this couldn't start off life in the prehistoric period. It might have later occupation within it through the Roman period and so mm. on. Uh, but these enclosures could easily be of a type that had been occupied from the mid-Iron Age onwards. So it sounds as if it would actually be quite useful if you compared our site with as many sites like that in the region. That would probably help us, wouldn't it? It would, because one of the things we have found out looking at these sites is they have similarity of location, where they occur in relation to yeah. high ground and low yeah. ground, river courses and so on. So the more information we can build up and compare how our sites compare with those we do know about, the more we'll be able to, to give it its date and its context. So put your hat on with the GPS in it so we know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> on the north side, things are progressing well. Phil and Faye have revealed a face of the wall and are investigating whether they've reached the foundations and the original ground surface. But as we lift the stones in the entrance to the east, the archaeology is increasingly complicated. 
Ian, when we laid this trench out this morning, we put it around this bit of wall because this lines up with that, and we thought that that had to be genuine. Mm -hmm. But now you've been looking at the photographs and have been getting me a bit worried. The interesting thing is this big stone that we have down at the bottom of the trench, which is currently lying flat, I think what's been happening is I think maybe this edge here is an edge to receive that stone. It's projecting slightly into the entrance corridor yeah. so that you can rest a timber gate of some form against it. So you'd have had a gate up against that stone. But then what would you have had, I mean, if you've got attackers, what would they, what, what would you have had to stop them knocking the gate backwards? One possibility is over here, where we've got this. And, and this looks very much like some kind of bar hole feature that's been deliberately built into the wall to receive um, a pretty substantial kind of piece of timber which you would you know, right. use to secure a timber door. Okay. Right. Problem is, it doesn't quite line up. It's no, not it doesn't. quite in the right place. Untangling the gateway isn't our only challenge. The site's produced no finds yet, and that's why Emma's environmental survey is going to be crucial. Emma? Hi, Tony. Why is it so important to do environmental archaeology on this site? Well, as this site is potentially a ceramic, um, environmental archaeology will probably provide us with the best dating uh, evidence that we're going to find uh, through radiocarbon dating, which hopefully we'll get from seeds or, you know, other bits of organic remains that have sort of pres been preserved in these deposits. What have you got here so far? Unfortunately, I've found three metres of not a loss. Um, I've got this very, very sort of um, fine, almost alluvial, what we'd expect to find in a flood floodplain, quite a way above the actual river itself. It's a bit of a conundrum, actually. It's very unusual. When you take this out of the cora, mm -hmm. you eat it, don't you? Yes, I do. Why? To find out what component of sand there is and what component of sort of finer grain sediment like silts and clays there are. And we can sort of get an idea of the ratios of sand and sort of silt and clay from eating it. What's it taste like? Not very pleasant, actually. I've, but I've... Do, does that enable you to say how it might have been deposited because yes. of the ratios of the...? Yes, it does. Basically, if it was sort of relatively fast flowing water, we'd expect to find a sandy, a sandy element. But this is very, very fine grained. So that perhaps suggests it was either standing or very, very slow moving. It's very, very unusual. So what do you do next? Uh, well, what I'm going to do is, unfortunately, because this isn't providing the evidence that we need, I'm going to move to other areas of the site and see what we can find um, yeah. on there. As Emma moves inside to find organic evidence, we've also begun to lay siege to the southern wall with a third trench. Since it's more built up here, this will increase our chances of revealing a well-preserved section of wall. One thing's for sure, it's going to be a mammoth job. We're hoping that this trench will give us an indication of the wall's original dimensions and how it was constructed. But at the north wall, with less stone to shift, Phil and Faye are well ahead of the game. Are we getting anywhere with this trench? I think we are, actually. Um, right. We've just started to hit a different surface or a different layer, so it's a lot more compact. So I think, actually, it's beginning to get quite exciting. Is that the old ground surface, then? And it's a difficult one to call. You see, the surprising thing is... You can see we've only got one two, three, four, five courses of wall. If I push my trowel, in there, it doesn't look to be another no. course there. Right. So down there, where you've got these massive walls standing metres high, that doesn't seem to have been represented here. It looks maybe as though yeah. it's been robbed away. But what is the big problem, of course, is trying to establish whether the wall is standing on an old ground surface yeah. Yeah. or whether it's been cut into an old ground surface. We just don't know. So what are you going to do with this now? We're going to carry on and see whether we can define our surface. <laughs> I'll keep my fingers crossed for that. <laughs> it's nearly end of day one, and as work continues on the walls, we're also clearing the interior to enable Geophys to survey inside to see if they can find evidence of settlement. Have we got a guardhouse, Francis? No, we don't, Tony, and we can be reasonably certain about that, and it's taken us all afternoon to sort it out. And th the answer lies in these ancient photos that Ian's got. Yeah, I mean, basically, it, it comes down to this large stone here. We can see from this photo, which was taken in the 1920s, that the stone would have been upright. And if it was upright, it would have sat against this edge that's just come up in the trench down here. Mm. Now, that means that this edge, which previously we were pretty confident about, 
is completely fake. It's been rebuilt. But this is a huge stone, isn't it? There's nothing else like it on the site. If you're saying it's standing up like that, that implies something rather more than a domestic dwelling or something. It looks like defence to me. I think so, and it wasn't just sort of flush with the, with the gateway, it would have stuck out, probably to, to hold something like a, a wooden gate. But if this isn't a guardhouse, what about that one there? Is that real? Yes, we're, we're very happy about that. We need to know more about it, but that's real, yes. I think we've actually cracked what this site's about. I mean, this is massive defence. I mean, there's even a slot there for a gate. You know, this is an entranceway that's protecting everything that's going on in there. OK, fair enough. I buy the fact that we're narrowing down our options. But what really excites me is what on earth was this place for? And in order to find that out, tomorrow we're going to go into here and start digging right in the very middle. Beginning of day two here at the castles in County Durham, and we're surrounded by this massive stone structure, which is a real archaeological mystery. Yesterday, we investigated the outside walls, but if we want to know what this place was and how old it is, then we're going to have to explore the middle, aren't we? How's the GFS going? Well, now we've cleared all the gorse, it's been a bit easier. And look, we've got hints of structures. Up on the platform there, you can see, there may well be a stone structure there. So, I mean, I'd like to have a look at that. Yeah, but we probably ought to put a 3 by 2 or something over just to see what that is, because it does overlook the site, doesn't it? But the point is, what it's not doing is getting us into the middle. When you came here and you just leapt across this ditch, yeah. what we're thinking about doing is maybe cleaning up one of Hodgkin's sections there, and you see we've also got one of his little trenches in here. Hang on, this is Hodgkin's original trench? Yes. yes. I it just thought it was a natural stream. No, no, no it's no, a They didn't believe in reinstating in no, those No, days, no, they did didn't. They? So what we could do is clean up some sections in those. We can actually learn firsthand at whether or not he actually found anything yeah. in the middle of the enclosure. So we can look in there, and we can look in there. There's this, actually... this is another one at the back. This, this is an unrecorded trench as yeah. far as we know as well, so we're going to use that as another section. And it does feel a bit like a First World War battlefield, yeah. I have to yeah. say. But you see, also, John has got the hint of some disturbance that actually goes where with that is. Aren't you worried that we're getting overstretched because we've got people working all the way around the perimeter? I don't think we're OK on that. Are you happy to get on? Yeah, of course I am. I was trying to look after your interests. <laughs> First time for everything. <laughs> <laughs> So John's results have given us a target for the interior. Our first hint of a structure, which not only might help us date the site, but also tell us what it was used for. Yesterday, we concentrated all our efforts on the exterior walls so that we could understand when and how they were built. On the north wall, Faye thinks that she might have located the original ground surface and is still searching for any datable finds. We're also beginning to learn how the site was constructed as Naomi and the team clear tons of fallen rubble from the southern wall. While over at the entrance, we've moved mountains to expose the gateway. But how does it fit in with the original guardhouse? Yesterday, Francis was adamant that what we'd got here was a gatehouse and what it was guarding was this big entranceway here and on the far side of the entranceway there would have been some form of gateway represented by this stone structure and in front of it there would have been that big slab with presumably some kind of door or gate swinging against it so is that still what we think the story is um, no. <laughs> oh, surprise, surprise. <laughs> I still think it's an entrance house of some sort. Yes. Okay? But it doesn't go with the original construction of this fort. Ah. Underneath this slab, the wall actually comes out. Now, this is new. It's stepped out, and it would have supported that stone vertically. So you've got a staggered wall of the entrance to the fort, and then Ian has found something similar on that side. These walls over here, which we've, we've, we've had for right from the start, what you'll see is that the alignments don't match up. And in fact, there's a very distinct step or, or recess that matches the one we have on the other side. So why does that mean that the guardhouse isn't part of this setup? Well, basically, what you would have had to have had would be another one of these big stones standing over here. Yeah. And it doesn't work with this gatehouse. So this gatehouse basically has got to be put in after that original gateway organisation has gone out of use. But that would look really impressive, wouldn't it, with two big stones and the big big wooden gates behind? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 
So the archaeology suggests that the entrance was fronted by two stone slabs flanking an impressive wooden gate. And what period do you think that this entrance could be? There's really no reason to think that this original entrance that we've got is an Iron Age. The use of these absolutely massive blocks integrated into a kind of unitary design um, is very much the kind of thing you see further to the north, the same kind of techniques of stone masonry being employed as you see in up in northern Scotland, for example, in the Iron Age. But I think what, what is more intriguing is what date this cell is. Because, you know, I can't imagine anybody, say, in the later Middle Ages or the mm. post-medieval period doing that. Uh, Tony Wilmot doesn't think it looks anything to do with Roman. That only leaves us the early medieval period. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it was to be a Dark Age structure slotted into an Iron Age structure, that would be very exciting. So we're still looking at a span of about a thousand years. Yeah, but if it's an Iron Age site modified in the post-Roman period, that would be absolutely cracking. So the Iron Age gateway might have been modified in the Dark Ages when a guardhouse was added. It's a lot of ifs, but it is our first clue to the castle's date. What's more, both entrance phases look defensive, helping us understand what it's for. But something doesn't quite add up. Stuart, this place is called the Castles, and you've got this massive stone wall here, and you've got this big gully here, which looks like it ought to be defensive. But if you look up there, you would imagine if it was a castle, it would be nestled right on top of it, but it isn't. Yeah. It's almost as though it were in the lee of the hill. You've summed this site up really well because it's not defensive at all, is it? I mean, you could, you could stand on that slope there and almost lob a flaming torch straight inside that enclosure. Absolutely. It's not a defensive feature. It's chosen for other reasons. It's a bit like Iron Age stone cladding. That's the best way to think about it. People are starting to show off in the landscape, demonstrating this is their area. We won't probably understand it until we start to look at its location in relation to the stream valleys, the hill slopes, all around. It's called the castles rather than the castle. Do you think originally it would have been lots of separate structures? No, I think that's, that, that's a red herring to some extent. It's just how farmers refer to things that they didn't quite understand. It looks, it looks like a collapsed castle to them, so they call it the castles. It's of no significance whatsoever, that name. In the interior, the archaeologists have opened two more trenches on the site of the antiquarian's old excavations. Their central position is the most likely place for occupation. Hodgkin had found stones here, and we want to check out whether they could be evidence of structures. As the new trenches get underway, our north wall trench has come to its end. So I see Naomi's doing the recording here. Does that mean we've finished with this trench now? Yep, we're closing this trench up. So what did you decide in the end? Well, actually, it's really interesting. What we've actually got is them using the natural slope. So right. here, what Naomi's sitting on is actually the natural. Right. And it That's all orangey, down. yellowy stuff yeah. down there. So is that set back into the mound then? Yep. Yeah, it is. And the $64,000 question, any fines from it? No, you were right, none at all. So we've really got no idea of date except for the type of walling it is, that sort of thing. Yeah, we have got the original walling, I think, there. Apart from that, I can't say anything more. Although we haven't discovered any finds, we're beginning to understand more about the construction of the site. Instead of being built on a surface, the north wall was cut into the natural slope. And after a day and a half, Mick's keen to learn how the southern wall was constructed. Naomi, why have you brought me to this dark, dirty <laughs> hole here? Well, there is a good reason for that, Mick. Right. Yesterday, on the other side of this uh, trench, we had one face of a wall, and we've discovered the other face. Oh, right, so this is the outer face. We had the inner face yesterday. That's right, yeah. So is this original, or is this a bit of Hodgkin's reconstruction? No, I think this is the uh, original wall, because I think if it was rebuilt uh, and reconstructed, it would be much straighter. Yeah. Uh, whereas this, as you can see, it's all starting to lean in and collapse slightly, and that's just a process of time, really. So what are you going to do next with this? Well, the plan is to carry on emptying out this fill and following the course of this wall down to see how many courses we've got. And that's the important thing, to see how the wall was constructed, I think. To help us learn as much as we can about the construction of the walls, we've called in a stone expert to survey them. About 60 mil. And stone wall builders to see if they can replicate a section. This is an absolute work of art. How do you compare your work with their work? They put stone on that way, what we call tracing, tracing work. We would put stone in that way, and we call that 
end in, end out. So that's actually given it a lot of tail into the wall and really strengthening the wall? Yes, that's right. We would normally build what we call a batter. Right. It would be two foot wide at the bottom and one foot wide at the top beneath the coping stone. Now for these walls and the, the walls we're replicating, they've built it as far as we can tell, nearly vertical. There may be a very slight slope. But nowadays we would build a batter and we would say that was stronger. In the entrance, we finally uncovered our first find. But sadly, it's not ancient. Hmm, dating evidence. Dating evidence. I think dating evidence for a rather festive excavation, <laughs> don't you? What would you say? Portal Madeira. Oh, something like that, isn't it? Yeah. Why did we put this trench in? Well, this is slap bang in the middle of that big geophysical anomaly that John picked up. And we, we actually positioned the trench so that we thought there was going to be a wall line going slap bang through the middle there. I can't see a wall line? No, it doesn't look like there's anything here. What about the trench down there? Yeah, well, come down and have a look at it. Well, there doesn't seem to be much more in this one. Ah, well, you see, the idea of putting this one in is, is working on the assumption, as Francis said, here we are in an Iron Age enclosure. Where is the most likely place for the building to be? Now, if you look back through there, we are slap bang in line with the main entrance. In fact, we are slap bang in the middle of the enclosure, which is the most likely place for the high status building. Now, if we assume that, that anybody but Mr and Mrs Clean and Tidy was living here, you'd expect to find some traces that they lived here. But we know there was ploughing here. Couldn't it be ploughed out? Ah, this trench is placed on a ridge, so the archaeology is more likely to be preserved underneath it, and the furrows are on either side. In nearly 6,000 square metres of enclosure, we still haven't found any dating evidence. So have things finally hit rock bottom? Let me give you some figures. Length of the perimeter of this wall, 320 metres. Right. Width of this wall, five metres. Right. Number of years it would have taken one man to carry all the stones to build this wall, a hundred, a hundred years. A very old and knackered man. Weight yes. of all the stones in this wall, 5,000 tonnes. Yeah. Number of archaeological finds we've got, zero. Yeah. Flipping zero. Yeah. We're, we're dealing with people who are getting most of what they use on a day-to-day -day basis from around them. They're using um, stuff that rots away that we can't see. It must be wood, leather, wickerwork, all the rest of it. But this isn't the getting all the stuff from all around the area age. It's the Iron Age. Yeah, but there isn't much iron about in the Iron Age. It's when it's introduced, but it's not that common. It's not actually that common until the 17th century. But in earlier societies, probably 90, 95% of what they used was made of perishable materials. So is it a mistake to think of looking for finds at all? Should we be just clearing away all the rubble from this place, finding out what it really looked like and then just comparing it with other sites and get a date that way? I think actually, in terms of a date, a more useful strategy is to try and find something in either the environmental samples or in the areas we're digging in the middle that's either waterlogged or carbonised, that's charcoal or something that we can get a radiocarbon date from it's going to be that date that gets us into the particular period it's occupied. But that, again, is a long shot. It's very difficult for us to understand, but that's the reality of the, the archaeology of, of this site at that time. Afternoon of day two, and with no internal structures or finds, the castles is still frustratingly mysterious. So we're throwing every means of investigation at the site. Emma's still coring, and we're opening another trench in the interior. But over at the southern wall, the archaeologists may have made some progress. Really pleased about this, Mick. We've actually yeah. got the bottom of the wall. Look at that. Oh, good. It's actually sitting yeah. on that yellow natural there. Yeah. So is it on an old ground surface down there? No, it's not. And right. that's really interesting, because it means that they're going to have to have cut into the slope and created a kind of linear terrace to build it on. And the reason they've had to do that is because I mean, we've now been able to measure from face to face, yeah. which is another good thing, 5.1 metres wide. Crikey. That's so a hell of a thing, isn't it? That's interesting, because when I was talking to Faye about the, the top rampart that's parallel with this, they did the same there. Oh, really? So it means yeah. they, they, they terrace that top in, they terrace this one in, 
I wonder what they did with the sides, because they run up the slopes. So they're either going to have to have got a sort of ramp effect yeah. cut, cut in, or they're going to have to have done it in yeah. a series of steps, aren't yeah. they? So, still no date, but at least the archaeology is consistent. Both the northern and southern walls were built on terraces into the natural hill slope. It's just so frustrating we've got no idea what the walls were enclosing. Are you two seriously trying to tell me that that jumble of rubble at the bottom of that trench could actually be the first archaeology that we've got inside the structure? Well, I think it could be, Tony. Um, the trouble is, those stones down there are actually inside Hodgkin's trench, so we don't know whether there's something left there by him or whether it's the remains of a collapsed wall or something like that, but it's the closest thing we've got, I think, to archaeology in here. You wouldn't like to hazard a date? Mm, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but tomorrow we'll Tomorrow know. we'll yeah. know. But that is the only evidence so far that we've got of any kind of occupation, yeah. isn't it? Not necessarily. Come and look at this trench over here. Because what we've got here is starting to emerge of features. Can you see the difference in colour in the soil? Oh, there? yeah, is that some kind of edge there? That's right. Yeah. It might be part of a curve, and in this central space is where we might expect the bigger hut circles, the bigger houses in the ah. centre. The problem is we've only got a small area open. We need to expand it to see if we can pick up the edges of something. But if we're not going to get any pottery, what can we get that will date it? Well, big roundhouses, you know, in the middle of a monument, facing across to the entranceway, uh, they are as good as any dating evidence. It doesn't matter if there's no pottery, nothing, just those post holes and those gullies will date the site. Yeah. So does that mean that we're going to put your gateway and your guardhouse on hold for a bit? Oh, good heavens, no. No, 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 no. I mean, we're, we're down on the flagstones, and when we lift those flagstones, which we'll do tomorrow, any dating evidence will be sealed underneath them. So I think we've got everything to dig for over there tomorrow. It's been a really frustrating day today, but at last we've got stuff inside, we've got stuff outside. Is our story beginning to unfold? We'll know tomorrow. Welcome back to this mysterious stone structure called the Castles here in County Durham. And after two really frustrating days, we're finally managing to sort out the guard house, the walls and the interior. Meanwhile, Emma's been eating dirt in a desperate attempt to sort out the environmental archaeology. I have indeed, Tony. And how have you been getting on? Up till end of day last night, not particularly well. But yesterday, at the very, very last moment, I found a piece of preserved wood probably at a depth that we actually be quite interested in. No. Nope. Just that tiny piece there. What is it about this piece of wood then that's so significant? That piece of wood lets me know that there might be seeds and insects that I can use to sort of establish what was happening when this site was occupied. So what are you going to do with this now? I'm going to take it to the river and I'm going to process a sample and we'll see what we get. So, beginning of day three and finally we might be able to date the castles. While working with 6,000 tonnes of stone, it could be a few grams of organic material which will give us an answer. We're also beginning to expose more stonework in the interior to reveal its function. So a lot of archaeologists in a relatively small space. What's yeah. going on? This middle area has suddenly got more exciting, and so we've brought a lot of people in to help with it. What's so exciting? Um, well, the main thing is that big spread of blue clay yeah. that we had in what we thought in the middle of the house there. Um, it's turned out to be a tree throw pit. That's not very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> what about the post hole? Yes, it's a feature, and it may be a post hole. This excitement is almost defined by the lack of anything <laughs> exciting. <laughs> ah, but Tony, over here is real excitement. Oh, well, these stones, there's so many more of them now, aren't there? Well, yes, Tony, but the key thing is the stones over there, they're well bedded in, and look, they form a distinct curve. That looks like a semicircle. You've got a curve of stones, and that can only mean one thing. What? A roundhouse? A roundhouse. What do we need to find in order to prove that it's a roundhouse? We need to find that there's occupation in the middle, and that's why we're stripping this area over here. What might we find, Francis? Well, if this is the centre of the roundhouse, then you're going to get a hearth, or with any luck, you might get the sort of spread of ash from the hearth. But there'll be something here. I mean, we're keeping our fingers crossed. This is our last chance. We've got to go for it. It's our last <laughs> throw of the dice to see if we can actually find this in the middle. So it's possible that we've got a roundhouse in the centre of the enclosure. But how does that fit in with the idea that the site's Iron Age? 
It seems to me that from everything the archaeologists have been saying, you've all pretty well concluded that this structure's Iron Age, or at least the first phases. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's pretty much right. I mean, everything, everything we're seeing from the, the architecture, the nature of the, the stone walls, and the, the, the lack of finds really from the interior, all of that points to uh, an Iron Age site. What do you think it would have originally looked like? I mean, we've got this uh, sort of massive, substantial uh, square enclosure that we that we saw when we got here, with um, a fairly um, elaborate uh, timber gateway across that. And then, in the interior, it's difficult to know. We might expect some form of central roundhouse, either right in the middle with its entrance aligned on the the main gateway, or perhaps slightly offset. And then around about it. It's more difficult to say. There might be smaller buildings, perhaps no buildings at all, perhaps just areas where um, stock were penned, where you kept your animals close, close by you, that sort of thing. How many people do you think would have lived there? Probably not that many. I mean, we're really, I think, talking about an extended family group rather than anything beyond it. And I think one of the interesting things here is that when you look at the size of these stone walls, a lot more people would have been involved in building this site than would actually have been living inside it. And if you'd like to learn more about Iron Age communities and the places they lived, you know what to do. Log on to the Time Team website. As digging begins to uncover more about the castle's date and function, our wall survey has revealed how it was constructed. Peter, this site has proven to be a hell of a problem to date. In places we have original build, and then in other places we have Hodgkin's rebuild. Yep. Is there any difference? We know that Hodgkins says that the lower few courses on this wall were original. This, with the smaller stones, thinner stones, this is Hodgkins rebuild. I can't help but notice these steps. Are they to get up onto the top of the wall? Well, that was Hodgkins' belief, but um, I'm not convinced they are steps. If you look at them, there's not a scrap of wear on them anywhere. Now, if these have been used as steps, the edge would be quite rounded and worn, and there's not a sign of that. I think this is the result of this part of the wall falling um, in ancient times, maybe a couple of thousand years ago, leaving the ragged end here, which they've consolidated with big stones, and then they've rebuilt this slightly thinner. As Peter and Phil unpick the individual stonework, Stuart and Henry continue to survey the standing remains so that Raysan can reconstruct the bigger picture of the site. We're also extending the trenches in the middle of the interior, where we're hoping to expose a half or post holes, which will confirm whether we've got a roundhouse. Meanwhile, Emma's finally found some organic remains, which might provide us with dating evidence. But will the paving slabs in the entrance be equally rewarding? There you go. It is not quite. Ah, there's cobble. Ah, ah no then. Well, that's quite good, isn't it? Cobbles underneath. Yeah. So that's no. continuous with this lot of cobbling. Yeah. Ah. That puts quite a yeah. big camber on the road, doesn't it? Does, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. We now know that the entrance was built with a finely cobbled surface covered with paving slabs. This is a heck of a long trench. What have you done to justify it? <laughs> well, we've got both sides of the original wall now, from that flat flag to that. It's 5.1 metres. We've bottomed the wall on each side and de demonstrated it's sitting on a terrace. It's a deliberate, artificially cut terrace overlooking this, this slope down. If we've got that edge there and that edge there, but then on top of that you've got all this rubble, mm. doesn't that imply that originally the wall would have been much taller? Oh, yeah, five metres wide width just screams height to me. I, I, three metres wouldn't amaze me as an original height. And that, overlooking that valley, would look incredible from that far side. That's almost as tall as you. <laughs> what have we got on this side? Well, Naomi's just putting in a little extension there. What's the extension for, Naomi? Well, Tony, as you can see, we've got these stones here. I know there's stones absolutely everywhere, but these stones are much flatter. They look much more purposeful, as opposed to those tumbled, angular stones over there. So what are you going to do with them? Well, we want to take this back and just see if we've got something real. Don't those look rather like the ones that we found up there? Well, that's the whole point, really. The way they're pitched and the size of the stones, even in the material they're set in, they're pretty much exactly like the stuff in Faye's trench up there. So, do you think it could be something like the base of a roundhouse? Well, we're hoping so. Fingers crossed, yeah. We can only check it out, can't we? We can only hope, yes. <laughs> <laughs> After two and a half days of struggling to find any evidence of occupation, 
we might have found not one, but two roundhouses within the enclosure. Our potential roundhouses fit in perfectly with our Iron Age model. But as digging continues in the interior, things are beginning to go pear-shaped. Yeah, that now looks like a bit of a bend at the end of a straight line of stones, doesn't it? It's not looking very roundhouse-like, more like a boat. <laughs> yeah, and also we've got more stones coming behind me. Yeah. Um, oh, so yeah. I think we've got quite a bit more work to do. All very well, but it's nearing the end of day three and there's still loads of work to do to confirm whether we've got our other roundhouse by the southern wall. Earlier on, our environmental archaeologist, Emma, got really excited about one patch of soggy earth down there. I have, absolutely. Um, this is the best waterlogged deposit we've got from the site. It's going to have the seeds and the beetles in that I need to tell us what was going on in the enclosure. How do you know they're seeds and beetles from a long time ago? Why couldn't they just have dropped here in the last couple of years? Well, they're sealed by the topsoil and they're at the same sort of level as all the floors across the site. Would you like to see some? Yeah, yeah. There you go. And are there any seasoned beetles in here? There surely are. Would you like to see what I found? Yeah, yeah. Well, we got seeds that suggested that there's a lot of activity and disturbance in the enclosure, which could be humans or animals. But we also got beetles, and we've got a specific sort of beetle that's associated with accumulations of like quite nasty sort of waste associated with human habitation and dung and manure. So that's what this earth's made of? There's a good chance. Thank you for sharing it with me. No problem. Have it back. <laughs> <laughs> so, Francis, did we get this house then? Um, well, no, no, we didn't, Mick. Um, we thought we'd get a hearth. We didn't get a half. We thought right. we'd get post holes. They're not post holes. Uh, but what we have got there are some plough marks which suggest that this house has been ploughed away, the centre of it. Right. But what we have got is over here, look. Yeah. So these are the stones, Mick, that we thought were part of the it's roundhouse. A lot cleaner now, isn't it? Well, it is. It's a lot cleaner, but as it's been cleaned up, we've seen that these stones are straight and form part of a rectangular building. Right. Right, right. so um, it's, it can't be Iron Age, I don't think, but at that end, it's cut by those furrows. So what date are they? 1780 was when this land was enclosed, so... Right, so a pre-18th century building, but, yeah. but, but not Roman or medieval, presumably. No. No, um, I think we're looking at something a little bit earlier than that, uh, earlier than the medieval. You have that cell thing over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That might be Dark Age. So are we really thinking this is a Dark Age building? Well, why it'd not? Be a wow if it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a speculation, but it, yeah. it, it, it could, could be, be, couldn't it? So it looks as though any Iron Age roundhouse that might have been here has been ploughed away. And instead, we found a square, potentially Dark Age structure, which would have been contemporary with the Dark Age guardhouse at the entrance. Tony, you've been fettling away all day trying to sort out whether this is just a tumble of stones or whether it could be something to do with the Iron Age people we think yeah. lived here. Have you come to any conclusion yet? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's structural now, Tony. Why do you say that? Well, the f stones are nicely laid, they're nicely flat. They have exactly the same relationship to the underlying ground surface as does the main enclosure wall. They're just covered with this um, hill wash. But these stones here, they're not really flat, are they? No, that could be the wall which encloses these, uh, these flat flagstones. So what do you think they might be? Well, we've got the geophysics um, just in this area. We've, yeah. got a, we've got a nice square edge on each side of it, just about under the polythene there, a little way that way. So it's not a roundhouse? It's not a roundhouse, but it could be something like a stockyard, something like that, a, a sort of rectangular stockyard under the shelter of the wall. It's great that at last we've got some kind of structure inside our enclosure, isn't it? It's a real relief. It is. It's absolutely great, isn't it? Although this roundhouse has also turned out to be square, we still believe it's Iron Age since it was built at the same time as the enclosure and was probably used as a cattle pen lying in the shelter of the wall. It's so frustrating, isn't it? Three days digging and nowhere have we got a find or any kind of datable evidence from the site at all. Yeah, I mean, it is disappointing, but that isn't actually the only way we work. When you come to a site like this and work on a project like this, there's all sorts of other things you can use. The, the comparative size and shape of the site itself, you look at its position in the landscape and see if that tells you anything. And we've done that and they've been very productive, haven't they? So we can say quite firmly, this is a late Iron Age enclosure. This is essentially 
a farmstead, a very elaborate one, but a farmstead probably of the late Iron Age period. Can we say any more than that? What we can say is where we've got evidence for this site in Northumberland at South Hedden, where there seems to be a largely pastoral economy mm -hmm. towards the end of the Iron Age, and that's quite important because we can then compare that with other sites where you find big enclosures, but there's only a very small number of houses in them. What's all that other space used for? It seems to be because you need space to bring the animals in. They're your investment. That's, that's your power base base, as it were, in this bit of landscape within which they live. So our three-day siege has brought us closer to untangling the age-old mystery of the castles. The enclosed farmstead was built in the Iron Age. Its five-metre-thick stone walls would have stood three metres high, and the eastern entrance was fronted by two massive stones flanking an impressive wooden gate. There would probably have been a large stone roundhouse positioned opposite the gate. Stone cattle enclosures were built in the shelter of the walls, which would have protected the livestock. Later in the Dark Ages, the gate was modified and a substantial guard chamber added. The central roundhouse was replaced by a square building. This is our best bet for a building, but what strikes me is the contrast between the massive presence of this monument in the landscape and the few fragments of evidence we've got for the people who lived here. Even though I'm standing right by something they built, the only things that we've found that have got anything to do with the people are these tiny bits of beetle. This monumental structure has been an enigma for centuries, but by pulling together a team of experts, from archaeologists to stone wall builders, we're at last clearly beginning to see its identity, even if the identity of the people who actually lived here remains tantalisingly just out of reach.